Australia's debt bubble is falling apart. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of the people. Hello, John. Hi, mate. How are you going? Good. So we're recording this on Tuesday evening after the Reserve Bank announced its rate cut. Yes. Yes, um, you know, look, a so significant day in in Australian economic history of the official cash rate going to 0.75 percent, the lowest on record. Um, the RBA had a whole series of reasons why they decided to cut, um, but 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 there's a bigger story to 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 uh, to explain to the viewers beyond what the RBA has officially said and what the mainstream media is is telling the public. Um, the way I look at um, you know uh, where we're up to in terms of the cycle is the de- the debt bubble is falling apart, um, and we're going to go through a whole series of indicators that that point to that, and then and then and then sort of um, uh, dovetail that into the RBA decision, um, and then obviously try to explain to the viewer, well, you know, what is the broader context, what's really going on. Yeah, I think that's really important because I don't think that the Reserve Bank's commentary today is actually that credible, and it's missing a whole lot of really important stuff. So we're going to touch on some of that, aren't we? Yes, yes, and, and and before we get into it, one of the key things to to, to, to for, for the viewers to think about is, in two thousand and eight, when they cut to three percent, this was emergency levels. Well, we are at point seven five. Well, if three percent is emergency, well, what is point seven five, Martin? Well, it must be at, re- at least red alert. Red <laughs> alert. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, look, perhaps <laughs> perhaps it's Armageddon levels. <laughs> well. Okay, it's in. The, it, we're in the new environment. Rates are lower around the world, right? But fundamentally, nothing has changed from a decade ago. We've still got precisely the same issues in play, and no way out. Well, we we have the same issues, but the issues are much more significant or and much more enlarged because the debt bubble is at astronomical levels com- compared to yep. two thousand eight. Yep, absolutely. The numbers are bigger. More economies are caught in, up in it. There's less room to move because of where rates are and a whole bunch of international issues over the top, as well as the local issues. But I think the local issues are probably where we should spend a lot of time today. Indeed, indeed. So, so, so yeah, so, so when I say that the debt bubble is falling apart, I mean, I mean, there's a number of things that, that I look to in, in, in recent data sets, and I'll get you to comment with, with some of the things you've been looking at, mm. um, that, that point to me that, that things are starting to go uh, like a, a miss in the economy. So the first sort of thing is, is credit growth. Uh, now, why is credit growth uh, important? I mean, I mean, this goes back to K- Steve Keen's work, that, that when you have a bubble, um, you know, what drives the bubble, um, and those sectors around the bubble, like finance, construction, retail, and real estate in particular, um, it is the growth of debt. And, and 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 so what we have seen is, um, you know, um, you know, over the last decade we've seen a couple of uh, periods of where credit growth has gone weak, and and to keep the bubble going, they have continued to fuel more debt, um, and, and, and like the fuel the growth of debt, and that has obviously meant that more households have got deeper and deeper into debt. But yesterday, as in Monday, the RBA released its latest figures for August. Uh, in terms of credit growth to housing, w- which I think is one of the more important figures that the RBA publishes, and it came in at a record low at 3.1%. So, uh, so, 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 so that was there. Uh, I mean, if you looked at um, annualized credit growth for investors, it only grew at 0.1%, which was which was you know at a low. Um, and the previous two months, July and August, well, you know, credit growth to investors, property investors, have actually been have 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 actually been going backwards. Uh, so you, you've got that on the mortgage side, and then on the non-mortgage side, uh, annualized credit growth to other what the other causes other personal, it came in at negative three point four percent. So so early this year, what, one of the things we talked about is is that. One of the reasons why non-mortgage debt was shrinking was because people were refinancing and, and, and taking debt um, from, say, credit cards, uh, car loans, overdrafts, etc., um, and, and personal loans, and putting that under the mortgage. Um, but 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 even though credit growth is continuing to um, weaken um, in in the ha- in the mortgage area, um, in terms of non-mortgage debt, it's still going backwards, and and, and that's obviously. Going into one of the next factors that we've seen is you know households in trouble with debt and obviously you know massive fall in consumption. So um, uh, so, so yeah, so when we look at um, households struggling with debt, so Friday last week 
we saw that the RBA released um, the June number for um, for the household sector number of ratios. So one of the key ones I'd like to look at is household debt to disposable income. It came in for the June quarter at 191.1, a record high. So obviously, you know, debt to income continues to exacerbate in the economy, and that that's obviously significant. So you know, you know. Um, uh, you know, now we're probably around the Irish 2006 levels. I think by 2007, Ireland got about 200% um, uh, because the debt kept on growing. But even if it was growing at a slower rate, um, but the but the debt is growing faster than incomes. Uh, and then after the GFC, um, when incomes fell because of because of the deep recession in Ireland, I mean the 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 ratio went up to about 210%. So so you know we, we still have a way to go to to reach uh, Irish 2007 levels, but we're probably around 2006 levels in terms of where we are on, on, on Ireland on this particular metric. Noting that on other metrics like uh, household debt to GDP, we are beyond what the Irish were anywhere through their um, through through the boom cycle. Um, so so you have that. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously when you look at annualized uh, growth in consumption. Um, we are at the slowest pace since 2012-13. Um, so only growing by 1.9%. Uh, and that's obviously one of the reasons why we have a recession in retail uh, and we're seeing job losses happening there and, and consolidation in the retail sector. Um, if you look at the national accounts, um, uh, the household savings ratio has fallen to its lowest level since the GFC uh, to uh, 2.3. Um, and that was for the June quarter. So, uh, and then obviously your data set, mortgage stress um, is at an all time high. So basically everyone's deep in debt, um, um, less people are saving, not people, people, are, people are not spending, um, uh, um, and obviously pe people are stressed. And then obviously there was a recent story that the ABC said that 600,000 households, uh, Australian households are struggling to pay rent. So people are, pay, are struggling to pay even either their mortgages or paying their rent. Um, and, and, and so this is obviously, you know, a, a, one of the key factors that says that the household sector that has really been driving the growth in the bubble because it's a household debt bubble is starting to fall apart because households can't cope with the existing debt debt load, and there is no appetite among households to take on more debt. So before we go on to some of the other factors, do you want to maybe make a couple of comments? Well, I think there's two points. The first is, yeah, the mortgage stress data is looking pretty bad again this month. So last month it went sideways. This month it's up again. I'm running the numbers now. So there's well over a million households now struggling in terms of mortgage repayments. That's the highest it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And that's the uh, workout of uh, big mortgages, flat incomes, and rising costs. You know, yep. so, so. The, the other thing to think about is that the um, numbers will be a lot worse, particularly the per capita numbers, right? If you look at those relative to the total numbers, because of the high migration that we've had, in fact, the migration has been supporting the growth numbers in Australia. You know, if those numbers were actually looked on a per capita basis, then we've actually had a recession for the last two to three years, right, in real terms on a household basis or an individual basis. So that's something to bear in mind, right? So it's not like the economy is actually looking really flash. It's only looking really flash because of the number of growth, in, sorry, because of the population growth, right? Yes, yes. And, and that is something which people forget all the time, right? Just because we're getting bigger as an, as an economy, that doesn't necessarily mean we're getting better as an economy. Right. Exactly. And I think that's worth thinking about. And then finally, just the building approvals number, which came out today as well. Right. Yeah. It's worth just noting that it was down again. Right. Dramatically down. And particularly the high rise sector, which was significantly off. Right. And, you know, on average, if you go back three years, there were 20,000 approvals a month. We're down to 15,000 approvals a month now. And there's a strong swing towards houses relative to the high-rise sector. So that's a very big drag on the construction sector ahead. And I'm already seeing more traders looking for work, not finding work. And in my surveys, they're basically saying, we're going to be able to work very soon. Indeed. And look, I, th I do think you make a very important point because, I mean, I mean, when we did the show with Edwin a few months ago about the high-rises, what did we say? Do a Royal Commission find out how many dodgy buildings there are, get to the bottom of it, 
and, and, and by telling the public the real story rather than trying to do a cover up, you actually going to prov- you know you actually will provide confidence into the market if you can show that you're taking serious leadership on it. But but you know, the obfuscation, particularly from the New South Wales government, um, with with Opal and Mascot and some of these other buildings that are out there, I mean confidence in high rises have just fallen through the floor. And, and to be honest, I mean that, like uh, unless if you can get um a, you know an engineer expert to to certify that. The building, the, the apartment you're about to buy, it, 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 you know, um, you know, look at that—that that it is up to a particular quality. You'd be mad to put half a million to you know eight, nine hundred thousand dollars on a high rise in the capital city because it's just too risky because you don't know what you're buying, and, and, and not only do you don't know what you're buying, the people who you think you can trust to tell you what you're buying won't tell you the real story. Yeah, and it's worth highlighting that it's not uniform across the country. This, right? If you look at Canberra, right, in the last couple of years. 90% of approvals in a month were actually for high rise. Yeah. And that's dropped away dramatically, right? Yes. So that's a really interesting microcosm of the issue that we've got here, right? Because these defects are not just in Sydney and Melbourne, they're in all the regional centres as well and the other major cities. And so this is going to be, I think, a very significant drag because my surveys are saying that households are not interested now in looking at high rise, even with 30% discounts, yeah. because there are too many unknown unknowns. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and the other point I would just make in terms of building approval, so when I looked at the data today from the ABS, I mean, when you looked at the total number of approvals for the, for all of Australia, it was the weakest monthly number since January 2013. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and obviously, a lot of these figures are, are you know, the weakest since 2012-13, and we'll explain why that is significant um, shortly. So, yeah, so, so we have, you know, weak credit growth, falling building approvals, Households struggling with debt, um, consumption down, savings down, uh, and then obviously when you look at the the employment sector, so so it's a couple of points to make here. So we did it. We did see in the last. Uh, unemployment uh, publication by the ABS a slight uptick from 5.2 to 5.3 percent. Whether you're looking at trend or seasonally adjusted um, uh, data uh, in terms of unemployment, we have seen that with job vacancies. If you if you look at the RBA chart pack, you're seeing that job vacancies have pretty much peaked and job vacancies are falling. And in a previous off-camera conversation that you and I had, I think your data are saying that retail construction in the small business sector, that's where a, a steep fall in job vacancies are occurring. Mm. Um, uh, and then obviously we're seeing more stories in the press around job losses in these key bubble sectors that have been supporting the bubble. And to, you know, obviously we've heard about a retail recession uh, happening. Um, and obviously you can see um, in, like you know, a whole bunch of empty commercial real estate all over the you know, country and you know i think last month i had the opportunity to go with robbie um to surface paradise and you know i mean you see a lot of empty commercial real estate um you know look along the retail strip uh up there so that was one example but obviously you know even here in wollongong you go down to the crown street mall and there's a lot of empty shops um so so that's again uh, you know, um, you know, evidence of what Mar- uh, Edwin has been saying about oversupply around around uh, the, the building of commercial real estate, whether it's for retail or for other purposes. Um, um, so, so, so yes, so, so you basically have that. So obviously, you know, on the 29th of August, you know, so that we talked about retail, just to go to construction. So on the 29th of August, the ABC reported that um, uh, the you know work in the construction sector fell by 11 percent in the last 12 months, um, um, and mainly driven by residential construction. So obviously, you know, some of the state governments and the federal government is trying to offset some of the um, job losses in, in residential construction with infrastructure projects, but 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 but. I think it's fair to say that so far there's not enough infrastructure projects to 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 mop up a lot of that slack that, that that's coming off the, the the construction sector, because and one point to make there is we had the mining boom, um, and then that sort of came off the boil in 2012 13, um, and then and then a lot of these people who worked in say the Northern Territory, regional Queensland and WA, where, where they, they transition to, they transition to in, into construction. And, and basically the last five years, we've seen this, you know, a new form of construction boom. And now all of these people are losing their jobs and, they, and there's no escape hatch in terms of going back to mining. 
Um, and then obviously, you, you know, so, so you, we've looked at you know retail, we've looked at construction. Then obviously, when you look at residential property listings, I mean, I mean they are low. I mean, you did a recent post with Edwin uh, about what's happening uh, there. I spoke to Edwin yesterday. He said that listings in Sydney are about seventeen thousand. He said that for a number of real, real estate agencies, they need listings at about twenty one, twenty two thousand, so that they can actually generate enough activity in the market so they can make commissions. So a number of um, agencies that Edwin says are hanging on you know um, for, for, for dear life um, and that if these listings don't come and it's an interesting phenomenon because this is one thing that you and I talked about off camera about we were expecting listings to rise in the spring season well yep. that hasn't happened to to a large extent yet and if that doesn't happen we will see businesses closed and jobs lost in the re and the real estate sector in the next um, three months yeah and on that particularly in my surveys there's a big swing in terms of attitudes, right? So three months ago, there was quite a strong expectation from households that they would put their property in the market. That's gone away, right? So I don't think we're now going to see a big uptick in listings in the next couple of months. Yeah. Which means that two things. Firstly, real estate sector is going to really struggle. Second is that the small number of properties that are being sold probably will be sold in some places at more inflated prices. But that shouldn't be interpreted as a recovery of the property market at all, right? It's a function of very low volumes. It's a function of weird supply and demand uh, issues in particular locations. And the dynamics in, for example, some of the upmarket areas in and around close to Sydney, compared within the regional and in the outer lying areas of, of, of Sydney you know, over in the West, are completely different. So I think we need to be careful in calling um, anything other than property market is in difficulty. If the property sector is in trouble, we know that the bubble um, is falling apart. And so and we've sort of laid it out here, credit growth, building approvals, households um, struggling um, with their finances, debt loads, savings, consumption. And obviously we're starting to see key sectors around this bubble um, uh, falling apart. Um, and we're seeing, you know, starting to see some job losses in these sectors and job vacancies going down. So, so when we look at again, what is the Arm what is my Armageddon thesis? It is that um, uh, that 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 when you have a bubble, real resources get concentrated in certain sectors: finance, construction, retail, real estate, etc. Um, those people who those businesses and individuals, and employees who who work in these sectors, earn super profits and super wages. They then enter into debt commitments at those super levels. And then once it starts to fall apart, they realize they can't make those uh, uh, debt obligations. And then that's when they start to get in trouble in making uh, servicing those debts. And then when you get a sufficient number of those people um, who, who can't pay those debts, that's, that, that's, that, that's critical mass. That's a systemic crisis. So, so, so we're starting to see that unfold, and obviously this is why the RBA, as well as the Morrison government, have been desperate to inject stimulus into the economy to to keep the show on the road. And obviously, we've seen today was the third cut since the federal election. Um, so we had one and a half percent on on election day, and now we're at 0.75. So, 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 so we've laid it out. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of what we think is happening in the economy. And obviously, what did the RBA sort of say in their statement to, to justify this cut? So they talked about downside international risks. Um, the trade war w w was one thing. Even though we, we have a strong trade performance um, and we apparently have a current account surplus, according to the ABS. So the trade wars so far, according to the trade numbers, haven't impacted our, 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 our exports to imports ratios. Um, so that's one. Uh, so, so, so yeah, so I think those downside risks should be discounted to date uh, in terms of having impact on the domestic economy because the trade numbers clearly say that we're not being affected by the trade war. Yeah, it's almost a convenient excuse, isn't it, to, to blame the international situation, right? It's also worth noting, John, that um, for the first time um, that we made more investments offshore than, than coming the other way, right, it was in the last statistics. And that's because all of the superannuation savings that households have put in to the superannuation system is looking for a home. A lot of that money has gone offshore because they can't invest it locally. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you have that. 
Uh, obviously, the RBA talked about weak uh, Australian GDP growth. It's a 1.44% annualized. Talked about weak and uncertain outlook for consumption. So we talked about consumption. And obviously, one of the key points, um, and, and I think they, they said this uh, in, in response to some questions that um, uh, Tim Wilson, the member for Goldstein, put on the, on the record at a recent um, economics committee hearing. They said that... Um, that the fall in consumption in 2018, in late 2018 in November, December, the, the, the RBA completely missed that. So the RBA was expecting strong consumption growth late last year. Mm. They completely missed that. Yep. Um, um, and, and obviously consumption has continued to weaken. And so when they say uncertain, so the thinking by, by, by Philip Lowe, and, and this even goes back to Philip Lowe's, um, um, uh, you know, when he spoke at the National Press Club, I think in February, yep. when he said that, no, look, you know, even if we cut, inject stimulus by cutting rates, you know, um, it will be sufficient to to keep um, consumption going, um, to keep mm. to keep the bubble going, um, and to keep the GDP growing. Well, that obviously um, hasn't played to date. And when they talk about uncertainty, I think the RBA sort of knows that um, you know, look, even this cut won't be sufficient to in, to inject um, uh, you know uh, people to spend, particularly because two two factors. One is uh, you know th- th- there's a lot more gloomy commentary, uh, even with the cut in rates. We have seen a dip in consumer confidence as well as business confidence. But the other key point is, is that you know, as they cut rates, and this is something you you said to me off camera, is that um, uh, households are using any savings they're getting from refinancing or if they're on variable interest, not to consume but to pay down no, debt. Yep. So, so, so obviously, you know, um, so, so, so that these are the, some of the factors around uncertainty around consumption. Mm. You know, weak, weak wages growth and, and weak growth around household incomes. Um, slow employment growth, including job vacancies, and obviously, um, you know, the inflation is b- is below the RBA's two to three percent medium term target, and they say, well, we need to cut to get inflation up. Now, that 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 makes that last point that last point of logic makes no sense. Um, you know, it doesn't benefit households to to make cost of living even more exorbitant than it is now. So, if, if inflation is at one point six now. The official number, I think, is completely bogus because of, because the the the, RB, the ABS rigged the inflation statistics, and we've talked about that in a previous post. So uh, now, uh, so if it's one point six, just take the one point six and say, well, we don't want it necessarily any higher because that's actually going to squeeze households, which means it's going to make debt serviceability even tougher. But but these were the key factors that they basically outlined in their decision, and they said at the end of the statement was that. Um, that they are prepared to ease monetary policy further, um, you know, if required, to support quote sustainable growth in the economy, full employment, and the achievement of inflation target over time. So, um, so, so, so yes, yeah, so, so they're saying, you know, even though we cut today, this is the third since the election. This is not the end. There is more to come. But obviously, we're getting closer and closer to that zero bound. Um, and, and obviously, this is where our commentary about negative interest rates and the cash ban and all of those other issues come in because we're getting closer to that critical point. Yeah, and I think it's just worth highlighting. The RBA some little time ago said, actually, a lower exchange rate would help to us to achieve our inflation target, right? So they were actually thinking that they could import inflation because of lowering the exchange rate. That's and right. that would be positive, right? And you've made the point, and I want to make it again. Higher inflation in Australia at the moment, with incomes so low, is actually not going to help anybody. Precisely, precisely. Um, so, 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 yeah. So, uh, I mean, the RBA's logic. Uh, I mean, look, the, the data's crap, and, and the RBA's <laughs> logic around in exorbitant uh, or, or, or high inflation rates. I mean, look, that 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 d- doesn't have justification. So, 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 yeah. So, 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 basically, you know, we're seeing. A whole bunch of weak data. Even though the here's the thing, the RB like the, the mainstream media is saying that property prices back up based on core logic, and and you and Edwin have spoken at length about some of the problems with the core logic index, about the design and the quality of the data, and, and the delay in the and the data and where that data is coming from. So you know, uh, obviously because we have relatively low volumes, I mean, should we read too much into property prices going up in Sydney, Melbourne? Um, you know, look, I mean. In, in, the, in the span of the Irish housing crisis, which went for four and a half years, there were, speaking to a number of Irish uh, contacts, there were at least two times where uh, in prices went up during that four and a half years. And, I, and in those two, pe- to, two periods that I was told that prices went up, all the spruikers, the, the, the establishment from, from the government to the banks, to the property sector, to the, to the media, they all said, this is the bottom, jump back in. And so even though we're seeing a slight uptick in property prices based on low volumes in Sydney and Melbourne, 
and, and I think Core Logic is saying now Brisbane to a small degree as well. Um, uh, Perth is still falling as well as I think Adelaide. Adelaide yep. So, so um, I, mean, I don't think we should be jumping for joy about property prices uh, now, uh, purely because the the uh, all this other data doesn't support you know robust uh, you know property price growth going forward. Um, so, so 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 that so that's what I would say on that. Um, and John, it's worth adding, I think that um, you know some people have been arguing the reason that you're seeing property prices going one way and credit numbers going the other way is a function of the limited supply that we've discussed and also the fact that people are paying back debt very heavily, right? Um, next week we'll get the flow data from the ABS and that will show us what the new loan volumes look like. Now interestingly, quite a few of my industry contacts have said there was a bit of a pickup in June and July, but that's now decaying as well. And if that's the case, then the chances of the property market continuing to surge forward, I think is almost zero. Yeah, yeah. So um, yes, and, and really to underscore that point, Martin, is so I have a picture. So I want to put this picture up for a while on on, on, on the screen. Now, this was this was a graph, like an earlier version that I showed in, in the debate against Christopher Joy. Um, and, and basically what we see here on this graph is, um, you know, the, the journey of, of annualized credit growth going back um, to 2008. Now, um, if, if we look at if we look at the graph, there were two times where credit growth basically fell, fell you know, it will fell or collapse. One was after the GFC, where it was about credit growth was about 12%, and it fell down to 6.4%. So by May of 2009, now how did how did they get um, credit growth to to get back up for households to borrow more money? Uh, you know, we saw a massive intervention by the RBA, cutting rates from uh, seven and a quarter percent to three percent. We also saw the Rudd stimulus package. Um, you know, in, in response to the GFC as well as the first time owners grant. And obviously, you know, on top of that, you saw massive global stimulus from China, uh, like, a, you know, China, like a, from China, but also from the United States as well. So, so then, so then, you know, it went up to from 6.4 to 8.2. Um, and then we saw um, ongoing weakness going into 2000 and 12, 13, um, uh, and, 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 and so obviously we hit, uh, uh, you know, a new low at 4.4% in January 2013, um, uh, and, then, and, then, and then the government was able to get, uh, you know, credit growth back, like, you know, like, sorry, the, the government was able to get credit growth uh, back up um, from 4.4, rising up again. So how do they do that? Again, um, massive intervention by the RBA, four and a quarter percent cut down to one and a half. We saw a rapid growth in, in, um, in terms of um, uh, interest only loans, as well as uh, in terms of the growth of investor loans. So, and obviously pre-Royal Commission, you saw a whole bunch of very loose and, and dodgy lending standards as well. A whole bunch of people got approved for loans um, that, that shouldn't have, particularly around when they were considering expenditure. So that took credit, credit growth up to seven and a half by uh, 2015. You saw a couple of interventions by APRA in terms of uh, putting some caps around, you know, in terms of the assessment rule around 7% around what the interest rate should be on assessments. There was a cap on, on how much the, the banks could grow um, their, their book around investor loans. There was a cap around interest only loans, uh, uh, you know, uh, around 2016, 17 as well. But, 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 but obviously since then, we've started to see uh, credit growth start to fall away. Um, and, and one of the key reasons why, so from seven and a half down to 6.6, .6, you could say maybe these, some of these APRA changes had an impact, uh, a small impact about the rate of credit growth. But what really fell away credit growth was the Royal Commission. Mm -hmm. The Royal Commission basically put the fear into the banks about criminal, uh, criminal liability. But obviously we saw a whole bunch of pre-Royal Commission practices um, you know, um, a lot of those sort of went away, um, uh, and, 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 and that you know that plus, you know, we could say, and we've talked about this in previous things. You know, Opal Tower, um, Mascot Tower, um, and, 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 and and you know, and, and so you've got that. But plus, you know, you know, some weakness in the international economy as well, and obviously we're seeing households. Uh, you know, you know, going, you know, exhibiting the behaviour that we talked about earlier, and, and, and that's why we have the lowest rate of credit, annualised credit growth. On record, and this series goes back to 1978. Um, so, so now they are in a desperate attempt. So, so these two interventions of 2009 and 2013 were, were, was how they kicked the can down the road, and now we're here in 2019 with the biggest bubble ever in, in the country's history, and now they are attempting to un, uh, to unleash, um, you know, um, you know, 
you know, more stimulus to try to rescue this. And so far, that stimulus is not working because of all the data that we're, that we're putting out, because largely they've run out of ammunition. I mean, you look at the RBA in 2009, they, they cut by four and a quarter percent from seven and a half, seven and a quarter down to three. And then they cut um, by about three, uh, three and uh, three quarter percent in 2000, uh, from 2011 to 2016. Well, they don't have that runway to, to cut now. So they've gone from one and a half down to, um, look at the one and a half down to, to three uh, to 0.75%. Um, um, and now they're, they're getting down to the zero bound and they're wondering what they're going to do. And obviously this is where you know, the, the, they've started to, to flag this and, and now there's more uh, mainstream commentary around quote unconventional policy. And we will see unconventional policy in, 2000, in 2020 because, because they're, they're hanging on for dear life to keep this bubble going. Um, um, and, and what is that unconventional policy? So whether it's negative interest rates, quantitative easing, helicopter money, m modern monetary theory, um, all of these things that we've been talking about, it is coming next year. Um, and, and it will be unprecedented in Australian history. Uh, and, and they're doing it because um, the interventions, uh, the, the whole host of interventions that uh, the, the kitchen sink, the kitchen sink uh, bubble strategy that we've outlined in a previous show, all of these uh, uh, factors that, that, that are being pushed by the Morrison government and the RBA to date, uh, as well as APRA to date, have not been working um, and, and they're running out of time to bring this bubble together um, so that they can, um, you know, avoid effectively accountability for, for one of the biggest economic crises in the country's history. Mm. Yeah, and it's worth saying, John, I think, if you think about the stimulus they've done over the last year, so the tax cuts and those other things, right, that's about one eighth of the size of the Rudd stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. So again, we don't have the ammunition from the government. The Reserve Bank is already at very low interest rates, and you're right, it could do unconventional things and take rates negative, but they don't have that same ability to drop rates, right? Yeah. And we've already got way more debt than we've ever had before. Exactly. So we're starting from a much worse position yes. in terms of the total debt that we've got in the system. That's right. Right. That's right. So all of those factors are in play, and so the chances of them being able to actually pull those levers and be able to get the outcome they want is extremely low. Yeah. Like this. so that is correct. So so it's extremely low. So so what I'm what I'm willing to go on the record tonight and say that independent. So so let's put the rest of the world like uh, let's put that to one side for a second. Yeah. So so I mean I think that we are seeing a slow moving train wreck um, that, that that that's going to result in uh, further credit uh, further further credit growth weakening and, and, and these bubbles bubble sectors continuing to fall apart into the rest of the 2019 into 2020. So we're going to see more weakness. We're going to see more job losses, more households will struggle. Um, and the question will be, will the economy require more time for these households to be in, in a deeper financial position um, in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, debt stress, you know, to cause, this, to, to cause a systemic crisis. So, you know, even before Lehman Brothers went under, I mean, I mean the Irish banks were really struggling. Now, we're, we're not at that point yet, but we're seeing the process starting to unravel. And, 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 and you, know, you know, I mean, there is a slight difference. And it's important we do a separate post on this, that one of the key factors that happened in the Irish crisis was that the ECB was raising rates in that, in that environment, whereas we're loosening rates. Um, and even with the loosening rates and the, and the loosening credit uh, and the loosening lending standards, and noting that on 1 January, we're going to see this 5% uh, deposit scheme come in. Um, so far, this is not enough to risk the bubble. Um, and, and if we see the, uh, these factors continue to play out, you know, we could easily sail into a systemic crisis independent of the rest of the world. And yet, when you look at the rest of the world, I mean, we've got massive issues in the U.S. banks, in terms of in terms of these repurchasing agreements, and you know the lack of liquidity in the short-term lending market, we saw a massive corporate uh, def uh, collapse with Thomas Cook, uh, and that's obviously going to make banks around the world more cautious about uh, corporate debt. Uh, and we've got big corporate debt bubbles in a whole host of countries, including China, as well as in terms of the United States, and and some of these other big corporates like Ford Motor Company uh, and GE have recently been downgraded. Um, and and so again, uh, you know. If some of these big corporates overseas, if the uh, overseas banks get into trouble and some of these European banks are struggling to make any money because of negative interest rates, um, one of these things could blow up um, and, and with a debt bubble starting to unravel, um, you know, that, that's Armageddon because, because too many households will just 
won't be able to struggle because they'll be losing their jobs um, and they won't, be, they won't have the income to service these debts and that's when they'll cause a disaster for the Australian banks. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, we go and look at the international situation and there are lots of leading indicators of risk. The derivative sector's looking very shaky. The repo market in the US is all over the place and the, um, the New York Fed is having to put more money in to try and get the rates to where they want them. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, you know, my perspective is this. So far as Australia is concerned, we should be watching the unemployment number very closely over the next um, three to six months. Because if that continues to go up, you know, with all the stuff that they're doing in terms of rate cutting and everything else, that will be the signal that the banks will start seeing real stress come through. We already know that 90-day defaults are higher than they've been. We already know that more households are struggling with uh, those mortgages at the moment, right? The second one to, I think, highlight is that if we see that that rate of change of credit continuing to decline, that is terminal for home price growth. It's not going to happen exactly. in that situation, right? Exactly. And if home prices start to go the other way again, and any of that optimism that was there in some people's minds dissipates, then you can bet your bottom dollar that that's going to be significantly negative. The third thing, I think, is that I'm expecting the exchange rate to continue to go south, simply because as the rates uh, you know, system works, um, I think the US dollar is down to 67 now at the moment, from what I understand. That's going to import inflation. So we're going to see those international price pressures coming in over the top. Those three are the factors that I'm watching in terms of how this plays out. Indeed. So, so like a, a short response. So, so credit growth, uh, look, that is the leading indicator. If they can't pour, pour more uh, debt into the bubble, the bubble is going to fall apart, like the like how we've explained this in this conversation. Yeah. And, and, and that was the one of the key points I made in the debate against Christopher Joy, that if credit growth continues to fall and people can't pay their mortgages um, and you start to see unemployment rise in these key sectors, people will panic just like an island um, and that will cause the, the systemic crisis. So, so yeah, so... Um, Falling credit growth will lead disaster to property prices, uh, number one. Number two is, you know, Christopher Joy, at the end of the mind debate, he said, no, credit growth will recover. And so far, that credit growth has not recovered. So, 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 so you know, credit, uh, Christopher Joy loves to say that he's always right. <laughs> well, to date, on the most important leading indicator, credit growth, he is dead wrong. Um, and, and now, could it turn around? Potentially, but uh, you know, I don't think the the RBA and the government have enough ammunition, particularly because debt households are so indebted to to actually get credit growth back up. But we'll we'll see what happens um, uh, over the next little while. But so, and the key point on that is, the RBA has released the August number. In four weeks, we'll find out the September number. And we already know the September number is weak because we've already had the Prime Minister in the, in the last week and a half and the Treasurer calling on the banks to increase lending. Yep. You would not get the government saying to the banks, lend more if credit growth was was recovering. So, so, so that tells me that September is going to be another weak number and we probably will see a new record low for annualized credit growth when the September number comes out at the end of October. So that's point one. Point two is in terms of unemployment. So unemployment is a lagging indicator generally, uh, not a leading indicator like credit growth. So, that, so that's important to note. The other thing to note is, is that um, you do not need a rise in unemployment to cause a crisis uh, around mortgages because all you need is in terms of, because remember, what is employment? One hour a week. Now, a lot of these people had full-time jobs. Some of these traders were working six days a week when they signed these mortgages. So even if they're having casual part-time work, um, and, and they saw a loss of income of like 40, 50% of their income, that's enough for them to spell disaster in terms of servicing the, the, either their non-mortgage debt or their mortgage debt. So, so uh, you know, obviously underemployment is going to be a more yep. critical factor. Yep. Um, and, and, and yeah, so, so yeah, so people, now, if a systemic crisis does happen, you will see unemployment rise significantly, but to cause the crisis, uh, no, you people do not, in the, in the initial stage, have to lose their jobs, they just have to lose the, the level of income relative to what they uh, had when they signed the mortgage. So, 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 so that's obviously a, a, a key point. And then obviously in terms of the exchange rate, so, um, you know, I mean, I have been saying that, uh, that they were going to junk the dollar. So remember what I said in the debate, housing crisis, dollar crisis, well, they, they're, going to, they're going to sacrifice the dollar to keep this bubble going. Now, they may not be able to save the bubble if they try, and they're trying at the moment, but, you know, we are seeing, um, obviously, you know, a whole host of governments around the world junking their currencies, and, Australian, and the Australian government and the RBA are following in that suit. 
um, uh, and that's obviously going to sell a spell disaster for the, for the long-term uh, purchasing power of, of the dollar, and, and that's not good for the middle class or for living standards. Yeah, so I think um, the message from today, John, is that um, there's a lot of important information coming, and the next two to three months will really be highly important to get a read as to where this is going to go. Exactly. John, thank you very much. Thank you. Martin North, John Adams. In the interest of the people, we'll see you next time.